Welcome to another amazingly incredible episode of Cosmological Fantasies. Here's the second part to our conversation with Dr. Asa Mittman. We really wander far from the popular understandings of Christianity. We talk about wild men, saints, and the divine. All of it interesting, all of it monstrous. I hope you enjoy. One of the things, like, um, I mean, you wrote the book on maps and monsters in medieval England, and one of the, like, really famous kind of images is the world map, that kind of TNO map. Yes. And it has, right, Christ at the top, and then it has, like, angels at the four corner, or two angels at the top with the censers, maybe the four winds breathing or blowing um, on the earth. And, all, mm-hmm. all, right, it, it is an image that is explaining the sort of majesty and, I don't, I don't know, control, dominion, the glory of God and, and his kind of control over creation. But then there's monsters in that creation. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, the maps, they, they vary quite a bit. But yes, the, the, there, there are, the, the setup that you give is totally on point, right? So you get a, the sphere of the earth. And it is always worth emphasizing that these people knew the earth was a sphere. <laughs> The Venerable Bede was a very important, influential uh, early medieval monk in Northumbria, Northern England. He gives us this great phrase when he's describing it. The earth is round like a playground ball, which tells us two things. One, he knows the earth is round as a sphere. And two, monks in Northumbria had playground balls. <laughs> Quite a surprise to me. And you know, he is one who was dropped off at the monastery at, I think, age seven. Uh, and lived a, a nice long life, and in that time left his monastery only twice ever, and both of those were to go on a brief trip to the nearest monastery. So he is contemplating the world, its shape, its organization. He writes a book on the nature of time itself, but he's doing all of this from inside the walls of his monastery at Monk Wearmouth and Jarrow, way up in northern England. The Earth was a subject of contemplation in the period, just like anything else. Um, and in fact, um, I believe it's St. Augustine, who is one of the most influential figures in Christianity. Uh, he says, the earth is our great book. And what he means is that the great book is, of course, the Bible, right? And what you're supposed to do with the Bible, he would say, is you're supposed to read it and contemplate it and think through every passage and every phrase and every word even to try and glean from it the uh, messages that God is providing. And so he's saying the earth, same thing. Do the same thing. The earth is here to teach us things. Uh, it is not happenstance. It's not the result of you know plate tectonics and evolutionary history and climate change, all the rest. No, no, no. The world was, they thought, the way it was because God had ordained it to be that way so that we could learn from it. And curiously, so you say, all right, it, it should be this perfect place. Why all the monsters? They're there to teach us things. Um, and so some of the main theologians of the Middle Ages, including Augustine, himself have these texts where they say, well, what are these things for? Why do we have monsters? Uh, They take their reality largely as a given. They don't contemplate, they don't seem to doubt too much. Like, could there be dog-headed people? Yes. Okay, sure. Given that we know that there are dog-headed people, what should we make of them, you know? Um, And Augustine's answer is actually uh, quite clever. But what he says is um, that monsters like dog-headed people, exist so that God can demonstrate that the laws of nature do not apply to him, uh, that he can do anything, that there are no laws or dictates that constrain his capacity to do things. And the immediate context in which he's talking about this is the apocalypse, the end of the world, the general (laughs) resurrection, which of course is what, you know, they're thinking about all the time anyway. Um, And So the thing is that the earliest Christians thought that the second coming of Jesus was going to be like on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Of course. They thought it was coming immediately. They didn't think it was going to be a thousand years or more away. Um, So they were prepared for it to happen in their lifetimes. That's what the earliest Christians all seem to have assumed was the plan. Well, it didn't, right? The world continued to go and it didn't end. And so then they start getting worried because, you know, when Jesus is supposed to come back, one of the things he's supposed to do is take 
the souls of the people who are all like just in stasis at this point and put them back into their bodies. And then they'll be judged and will go to heaven or hell for all eternity. The problem is the bodies go away after a while, right? Right. And so people are worried. Well, the earliest martyrs, their bodies are gone. They've rotted. They've crumbled to dust. And then uh, Augustine says, but what about also like people lost at sea, people eaten by wild beasts? Where, how is God going to do this? So the resurrection will show up and they'll be, you know, Joe's soul, but Joel's body is gone. And Augustine's answer to this concern is, what part of omnipotent don't you understand? <laughs> right? Like all powerful, it means all powerful. It does not matter that you have come up with what sound like a few technical hitches. If he wishes something to be, that thing is. Um, and so Augustine says, dog-headed monsters are the proof of this, right? Because we know that they shouldn't happen, but they do happen. Why do they happen? God puts them there so that we will learn this specific lesson and not be worried about the earliest martyrs not being able to be resurrected at the end of time. Hmm. I, I mean, there is a, that theme is in the text. It's in the New Testament in a few places where mm -hmm. Jesus is called upon to heal someone. And uh, the apostles are like, Jesus, like, why is it like this? And he says, to manifest the glory of God. Um, right. Uh, he did that, I think, with the, the blind, the blind men at the pool of Bethesda. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think this is a theme in in Christianity. I don't know what is, but if that theme continues for other religions, but at least here it is. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it does one of the great eternal questions that religions ask, you know, why is there suffering in the world, yeah. right? Uh, and especially if you have a worldview where you think that God is perfect and benevolent, right? I mean, the the say the ancient Greeks and Romans, they believed there were deities who made the world. They didn't think they were benevolent. <laughs> So there was a lot of suffering because the gods were terrible. They were jerks. <laughs> you know, mostly they seem to have paid attention to humanity when they got bored or horny and wanted some entertainment. But they didn't have some general predisposition in favor of humanity and justice and happiness. None of those were, you know, factored in. That wasn't what those gods supposedly cared about. Um, but if you have a religious system where it is believed that God uh, created and sustains the whole universe and is benevolent. Well, then why is there suffering in the world, right? I see, you know, poor people starving in the streets. I see people who are ill suffering tremendously. I see good people dying young while the wicked live on in comfort and excess. You know, what explains that? And so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of the effort expounded is to answer, you know, those very difficult questions. Uh, and right, sure, so that we can see how great the glory of God is so that we can see these things manifest is, you know, one of the rationales given. Um, there's a, there's a really interesting one that I often think of. Um, so is a, a really beautiful um, 11th century uh, church in Ely in England, just outside of Cambridge. Um, it's a beautiful, tiny little town. It has this incredibly giant, gorgeous, beautiful Norman cathedral there. Um, and it was founded, not that original building, but the uh, monastery and convent. It was a double house that had nuns and monks in it. Uh, it was founded by a Scottish princess whose name was Ethel Dreda, um, who was married off by her father to a polytheist, and she refused, saving herself for Jesus. Um, and the, the, uh, her spouse dies miraculously. <laughs> and so the father marries her off again and again. The, the second husband dies miraculously, keep you know protecting her virginity and so on and so on. Um, so after the second one dies, the father shrugs, says, all right, fine, whatever, just get out of my hair. And she and her handmaid walk all the way down England to Southern England from Scotland to found this monastery out in the Fens. It's like a, was originally a, like a swamp out there. Now they've drained it all and it's this lovely rolling countryside. In her later years, when she was the abbess running this double monastery, monks and nuns, um, she developed a goiter on her neck. And that's a very painful thing and a very unpleasant sort of thing to have to have. Um, and, uh, you know, we might say, oh, well, she probably had a thyroid condition. Maybe she needed more, uh, you know, iodine, whatever it is, right? Um, 
But what she says is that it was a blessing from God. It was a tremendous gift. And she loved it so much that according to accounts we have of her life, she sung songs to it, to her goiter. And she did this because as a young princess, she had been very proud to bedeck herself in jewels. And so all of those necklaces she had hung around her neck were in essence weights pulling her down to hell. And this goiter was a kind of recompense for that. It was a way to make up for that youthful uh, vanity um, through this suffering um, in her mature years. And so she viewed her suffering, this physical ailment, as a great blessing and a gift. Um, so this is you know, just sort of one of the many ways that people in the period found to kind of explain why, I mean, here's this woman who's dedicated her whole life to God. She's founded this monastery. She seems to be living a holy life. Why on earth would she, of all people, be punished with this terrible form of suffering? And that's the answer that she herself provided for that. Huh. I, okay. For the audience, that might seem like a weird story. Yeah, and to, me, to, to the modern years, it is a very strange story. But the thing is, in the overall like Catholic tradition, it's actually not that strange. There are a lot of stories of saints or, or well, like monks or nuns or, or whatever, suffering, but then seeing that suffering as a blessing. So Absolutely. It is fundamental to the Christian tradition from the very start because, of course, that's what Jesus does. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's not some weird sidelight. It's the main show, you know, taking suffering on oneself for a sacred and holy purpose, right? Exactly. Okay, so one of the things, kind of rewinding back a little bit, I could you give us your definition of monsters? I've heard you describe it before, and I really like it. <laughs> sure. Um, well, so monsters are sort of undefinable, right? It's a very strange category that is largely formed by excluding everything else, right? <laughs> so what do you say? that's a person, that's an animal, that's a rock, that's a tree. And then there are these other things that we don't have a category for. We often call those monsters. But in my thinking about what makes a monster, you know, I was trying to, I was trying to define this thing that's only defined by what it isn't through all these categories of exclusion. Is there anything that is fundamental to it? And how can we tell? So monsters generally are scary and dangerous, right? But a lot of things are scary and dangerous that aren't monsters, right? So, you know, a lion is scary and dangerous and a wild boar is scary and dangerous and a great white shark is scary and dangerous, but they're not monsters, they're animals. How do we know the difference? Um, and at least what I would offer is that a monster is not defined by its own properties, but by the responses that we have to it. That a monster is actually a kind of relationship between somebody looking at a phenomenon and the phenomenon itself. So what I mean is, if we experience something that suggests beyond just, oh, that's a scary thing, um, if there is some kind of fundamental destabilizing property to it, something that causes us to think, but no, that's not how the world works, that causes us to re-examine how we expect the course of things to go. If a large and dangerous animal causes harm to a person, we don't think, how could this be? This makes no sense. Of course that makes sense, what large animals do, right? But, um, for example, Jaws, right? Jaws is just a shark, right? Sharks do sometimes eat people, so it must just be an animal. But here's the thing about Jaws. Jaws follows the boat and seeks revenge. <laughs> and he does so across several sequels, even though he gets blown up. Um, so, okay, sharks attacking people, relatively normal. I realize they don't do this a whole lot. They're not nearly as dangerous as most people think, but it does happen. But sharks don't seek revenge. So um, in the old Stephen King novel, Cuju, there's a giant dog. Well, dogs can be very dangerous. Dogs sometimes attack people, but they're dogs. Kuju, when he's got the family trapped in the house, he cuts the phone lines. <laughs> okay, so Kuju's a monster. Kuju's not a dog anymore, or he is a dog and a monster at once, because that is not how dogs function. Dogs do not cut the phone lines. They may bite you. Yes, they may chase you. Yes, but there's some other element that comes in to say, well, wait, 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 that's not 
how I experience the world. And so I would argue that monsters are beings that cause those kinds of moments of destabilization for us, that challenge our preconceptions about how the world works, what its fundamental organization is, how it operates. And you'll often see in monster movies and monster novels and so on, the characters who are in there who are kind of proxies for us reacting in tremendous shock uh, at these moments, right? When things just aren't supposed to work that way. They're not merely concerned about a physical threat, but there's an additional element of fear and often horror that comes from this destabilization of our understanding of the organization of the universe. Yeah, I I was thinking about that that definition a lot. Um, I, I, when I was trying to put images together for this, I, I ran across several images of, of wild men uh, in medieval mm -hmm. art. And I think it's... It's kind of interesting because the, the wild man is basically a hairy person. A person is covered in hair, head to foot, Bigfoot, Sasquatch. And yeah. right, if you saw that, that's that's monstrous, right? When you're talking about the sort of intrinsic value of it, it's a monster, right? But the thing is, though, it's kind of funny how even an individual being like that can actually sort of pass in and out of that category of monster, depending on how we react mm -hmm. to it. The one I'm going to use is the thumbnail art for this episode uses Sesame Street monsters. And I think it's funny, right? Mm -hmm. We call them monsters. They are hairy. They are wild men. But we don't treat them like monsters, right? They, they're just people at that point. So it, right. it's really funny. Like that, that, the, why, I really, why I really like the definition is that monsters are not the thing. It's the attitude toward the thing. Absolutely. Um, there's a great book by a scholar named Noel Carroll called... Um, uh, the subtitle is Paradoxes of the Heart, I think. What is it called? Anyway, it'll come to me. But um, wonderful book that I've taught many times. I should remember the, the title of off the top of my head. But um, what he, uh, one of the things he does, he works through he's trying to figure out what horror is. And to do that, he winds up talking a bunch about what monsters are because they're kind of fundamental to horror. And one of the examples he gives, he talks about Chewbacca, right? And <laughs> Chewbacca, if you encountered him in any other context, would be a monster, right? And in fact, in the rather mediocre Solo movie, when Han Solo first encounters him, he, everybody around him seems to think he's this horrible monster. Well, he looks like a werewolf, right? He's this sort of humanoid, hairy thing. He's got giant fangs. He's tremendously strong. He, you know, speaks in very uh, uh, bestial growls, right? Um, but they all know him. He's just, you know, one of the team. He's a hero. He's a friend, right? Um uh, uh, so if you plunked the same actor, what is that? Peter Mayhew, I think, uh, and put him in the same suit and then put him in another movie, he'd be a monster, but he isn't in Star Wars. He's just a person. And so, yeah, it depends a great deal on, um, the responses of people inside narratives, as well as our responses outside of them to determine what is and isn't actually a monster. Um, I mean, one of the things that I, I find really fascinating, some friends of mine have for years been talking about writing a book, uh, editing a collection of essays on monster babies and children. <laughs> um, because there are images, not a ton, but there are images of monster families. Um, there's one great one of uh, a wild man family. Actually, I think there's two that I know of, of wild, wild people families um, that were both in the show that I curated that was at the Morgan Library. One's a tiny little manuscript with these tiny little images, and the other was a giant tapestry. Um, but both of them depict mother and child monsters, and then uh, mother and child uh, uh, wild people, and then male wild people as well. So in, in this manuscript, what you see is um, there is a female wild person who is completely covered in hair except for her face, her hands, uh, her sort of lower feet and toes, and her breasts. Breasts are almost always not covered in hair in the period. <laughs> um, which, is, you know, allows the images to be eroticized maybe more directly for the uh, standard human viewer. Um, and she is standing off on one side, and she is holding the hand of a tiny little monster baby. It looks like a little toddler who comes up to sort of her hip. Um, and then rushing in from the other side is a wild man uh, who is sort of racing in, 
Uh, he's got uh, one fist raised up into the air as if he's sort of shaking it. He's carrying a giant club with him, which is a standard element that we see wild people have. And also his genitals are distinctly emphasized, even though they are covered in fur. There's like black pen lines drawn on top of the fur. So you can't miss that. Um, and so what we have is on the one hand, these like just three monster monster people. But on the other hand, we have what would have been for a medieval viewer, a pretty normative standard domestic setup where there's a mother and a young child and an angry uh, male figure who may be husband and father here. Um, and so on the one hand, they're clearly these non-human outsider figures, but on the other, they are replicating rather perfectly the standard domestic unit of the, you know, medieval humanity. I, yeah, I, th- that was a, one of the funny things is, again, while I was gathering images, I um, was trying to look up uh, the devil with a butt for a face. And then I, I found Martin with <laughs> Sean Gower. I'm not sure how to pronounce the name. Sean Gower. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, the two images I found is it is the mother suckling the child, basically the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. One's a wild woman covered in her hair, and one of them is the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. And it's like the same image. Um, so yes. it's really kind of interesting to see, like, okay, monster, but just like us. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I have a theory about. Uh, first off, yes, the, 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 the monster. Uh, um, sort of holy family of monsters is definitely a motif. Uh, the other thing I mentioned, that big tapestry, it has that. So it's got a mother and child enthroned, sitting there in grandeur, looking just like a, an image of Mary and baby Jesus. Um, and then they are being visited by uh, three, <laughs> um, three male wild people who are bearing gifts. And so it's, the nativity scene it's the uh, uh visit of the three wise men right but the wise men uh one of whom is in fact crowned but he's wearing a crown of uh, uh like a leaves this is a, a plant crown um but their their gifts are um one of them has a stick uh one of them has the leg of an animal like just a haunch just a chunk of meat the animal is right at his feet so we can see he's like captured what looks to be sort of a leopard torn off its leg and is giving it to her um, and then the other has an entire lion slung over his back, and that's what he's going to give her. So we have, you know, Monster Mary, Monster Jesus, and Monster Three Wise Men, uh, <laughs> including one kneeling down in the front. He's very reminiscent of standard uh, medieval wise men imagery. There is a second monster child in this scene, which uh, it makes it slightly different, but we do see this as well uh, because we get a lot of images of the infancy of uh, Jesus and John the Baptist. John the Baptist um, is the son oh. of Elizabeth, who's Mary's cousin. Um, and he's born slightly earlier. They're both pregnant at the same time. And there's a very cute image you see in a lot of medieval and Renaissance art of these two pregnant women, like coming together to hug with their big bellies sort of bouncing in the middle before they can reach each other. Um, but so John is born first and he's a little bit older and he kind of in the stories is sort of foretelling the rise of Jesus to come. And then he's the one who baptizes Jesus in the River Jordan, hence John the Baptist, because that that's what he's doing. Um, and so we do see images where, you know, the Holy Family is sitting around and John the Baptist is hanging out with them too. Uh, the most famous of these is a pair of paintings by Leonardo da Vinci, um, the Virgin Among the Rocks. There's two versions of it, but um, those have Jesus and John looking back and forth at each other, just as they are in this image. Um, so I- even in that, it's not anomalous. Um, so yeah, there is a, a lot of overlap. And I, I think... I think there's multiple things probably going on here. So one, monsters are more interesting for being closer to us. (laughs) Um, Maybe this is just me. I tend to be much more interested in the humanoid monsters than I am in bestial monsters. So a wild man or a dog-headed cynocephalus or a headless blemmy or a one-legged skiopod, these are more interesting to me than a dragon. Dragons are quite other to us. They, they don't resonate as anything like me, and I don't feel any particular kinship with them. I think they're awesome, and I'd love to have a pet one, but, um, but I don't really identify with them. It, 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 the closer a creature is to human, the more it teases at our 
sense of self, the more it pokes at our fears, our anxieties. Um, you know how looking at great apes is kind of unnerving? <laughs> Um, so, you know, if you go to a zoo and you lock eyes with a chimpanzee or a gorilla, you can't not see a reflection of the self in this being, right? With which, I mean, chimpanzees and us have what? It's like 98% identical genetics, right? Yeah. They are practically us and we are practically them. And looking at them reminds us of uh, that the, the connection that we have to this whole process of the animal world, that we are not somehow separate and magical beings. Uh, and it's unsettling to look at these creatures, which don't behave quite the way we do, and behave in ways that would often be uh, inappropriate or shameful or wholly unacceptable in most societies. The, the, you know, that's what you will see going on with any group of chimpanzees in a you know enclosure together. But of course, they also have society, they have kin groups, they have tribal groups, they uh, enact war, so they will go to war with neighboring groups and also with neighboring human groups. They use tools to eat, but also to make weaponry to attack with. You know, so, I mean, how different are they from us? And so the wild people, of course, yeah, they're a whole lot like us. Um, and so their kind of distorted and deformed resemblance of humanity casts an ill light upon us. But then, why holy trinities of monsters, right? The Virgin Mary and Jesus as monsters? That's, you know, straightforwardly heretical, surely. <laughs> um, and yeah, but the thing is that these are beings which aren't quite like us either, right? They are somehow fundamentally different. I mean... Jesus is a figure who is the son of himself, who dies, returns from the dead, wanders around for a while having returned from the dead, and then launches off to live bodily in heaven, where he calls his mother, who is dead, to live with him, and then marries her in heaven. Um, none of this echoes the human experience in any particular way. Um, divine beings are quite different than we are. One of my favorites is a St. Bartholomew, um, who is, he is a flayed saint, so he is executed by having his skin peeled off him while he is still alive. And in some later medieval versions of this tale, particularly, um, it took me a while, I was trying to track this down, there's a, 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 a the earliest example I could find comes from a, a town not far from Venice in northern Italy, uh, but uh, we see this in images too, where all right, so they flay him, right? They peel his skin off, and then he stands up, picks his skin up, ties it around his neck like a cape, and walks off, and then preaches for two days <laughs> as a sinless horror. And in some of the medieval images, you know, he's up there on a little soapbox preaching to the masses, and the masses look terrified. <laughs> well, of course they do. He's preaching with no skin. Um, so the divine and the monstrous, they are, in a way, on a continuum. You know how, like, the in politics, it's a circle, not a line. So if you wrap far enough around toward the liberal side or the conservative side, you meet. Well, that's kind of how I think the spectrum works for humanity, which is to say, we think of humans, you know, we're the good middle point. And then there's monsters. Well, that's the bad end of the spectrum. And then there's, you know, divine beings. That's the good end of the spectrum. But the divine beings and the monsters really wrap around and touch at the edges. And of course, no uh, better example of this, I think, than demons, who are angels, right? Demons are the fallen angels. Lucifer, the name itself means bringer of light, bearer of light. He was God's most glorious right-hand man angel, um, who, according to you know, Christian uh, exegetical tradition, um, sets up so God leaves his throne. How God, who is everywhere all the time, leaves his throne is never made clear, but he leaves his throne. And uh, Lucifer takes over that throne 
and convinces uh, half of the infinite horde of angels to join him. And then Michael comes. Michael is a uh, sort of God's strong man. Some, the, some of the angels have very particular roles. And so Michael is the one who like is in armor and goes and does the fighting for God. So he battles Lucifer, throws him down to hell. And in the process of that fall, the angels are turned from these beings of beauty and light into images of, you know, monstrous horror, but they are still divine beings. And so, you know, we find these medieval theologians debating this. Like, what does that mean the nature of demons are? Um, and one of the fascinating things they decide about them, um, this in part comes out of actually uh, lives, uh, uh, you know, saints' lives written about uh, St. Bartholomew, the same guy who walks around with no skin. Well, before that, he does a bunch of casting out of demons from people. It's one of his sort of main things. And he casts them out from statues as well. And so, you know, when we look back on religions that are basically not practiced anymore, like Roman polytheism, for example, we tend to think, oh, well, okay, those people had a bunch of myths and they thought they were worshiping these things, but in fact, they were just making interesting works of art. But the works of art are just works of art, and they were, yes, conducting rituals and rites and sacrifices in front of them and believing that they had an influence on their lives, but they were just making this stuff up, right? That's sort of the modern view, I think, of a lot of past religions where there aren't really any people still believe in them. And frankly, a lot of people who believe in one religion believe that that's what all the other religions <laughs> are, right? Um, but what medieval folks said about um, the uh, polytheists who were setting up these images, because they called them idol worshipers, right? The idol worship is bad. It's banned by the second commandment. Um, so Jews are against idol worship. Christians are against idol worship. Muslims are against idol worship because that same foundational set of commandments is shared across those three religions. But the thing is that, at least with the, these medieval Christian texts I've checked out, um, they're against it not because it's nonsense. Why would you care if it was pointless? They're against it because they think it works. <laughs> the reason they think it works is because those statues, which people think are inhabited by gods, are actually inhabited by demons. And so they can go and ask these statues questions, and the demons will answer. But the thing is, we learn, demons know stuff. <laughs> they know stuff because they're angels, and they lived in heaven, and they've been around since the beginning of time, and they have power. And so people would ask these idols questions and get factually correct information from demons. And that is the basis of a lot of the sort of anti-idol worship um, propaganda of medieval Christianity. Um, and so again, these demons, which are, you know, monstrous, they often have lots of faces all over their bodies, particularly on their rear end, also on their genitals, um, <laughs> but on their elbows, on their knees, on their chest, on their abdomen, they got lots of heads coming out of them all over the place. They will have big talons and sharp fangs and long tongues. And they will have, you know, things that look sort of like bird feet while they've got lion's paws and bat wings, right? They're these composite hybrid, wonderful monsters. Um, but they are still powerful, not because they are monstrous, but because they are divine. Hmm. So, I mean, speaking of Revelation being the exciting book, some of the <laughs> images in the Bible... Okay, th this is a bit of a meme, and I think the meme takes it a little bit far, but some of the images that of what presumably would be heavenly beings do seem very monstrous, having multiple heads or multiple eyes like yeah. all over the body, you know, multiple horns. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Absolutely. There's a, a kind of old article now, came out in like... 2003 or something um that is uh it's by um bob mills yeah robert mills um it's called jesus as monster and it looks at medieval imagery uh, uh, akin to what you're talking about so how do you represent the trinity so there's this christian concept oh, that yes i, I um, love those paintings <laughs> yeah so god the father right who is the jewish god yahweh who is the ancient Near Eastern polytheistic storm god. Um, that's where he originally comes from. So, you know, the ancient Hebrews are one of the many groups who live, you know, uh, with the Sumerians and the Babylonians and the Akkadians and all these folks. And they have a shared pantheon of, you know, storm god and a moon goddess and a sun god and all the rest of this, yeah? 
And so the storm god, who, like Zeus, like Jupiter, like Thor, is violent, repressive, and vengeful, um, that's Yahweh. So uh, uh, ancient Hebrews start practicing a, a kind of in-between between polytheism and monotheism, start practicing a thing called henotheism, where a group believes there's a lot of gods, but they give their worship exclusively to one. And so that's what, for example, the first commandment, which is, you will have no other gods before me, for I am a jealous God. That's not a statement of monotheism. It's often misread that way. He doesn't say, I'm the only God. He says, of all the other gods, I come first. Right? So anyway, Judaism begins uh, before it is actually quite properly Judaism. It's a, a, a polytheism, and then it's a henotheism, and then eventually it sort of ossifies into monotheism. Well, Christianity then decides that that God, Yahweh, the ancient Near Eastern polytheistic storm God, um, is the only God, as Jews have had him then for uh, centuries. Um, but then he has a son. There's a huge amount of debate for the first several centuries of Christianity's existence. Is Jesus the same as God? Is he a part of God? Are they separate beings? Is he human? Is he part human and part divine? Is he entirely human and entirely divine at the same time? The nature of Jesus is a big mystery. And then there's this other thing, the Holy Spirit, which gets folded in as well. And so how do you represent this being? And one of the ways it gets represented is with a, you know, a single body with three heads, which is very monstrous. And there are, in fact, other monsters that are the same, that are three-headed one-bodied monsters. It's not that uncommon a sort of setup. And so, um, so yes, absolutely, uh, there are elements of uh, monstrosity in the most sort of sacred spots. And I, I, I guess I would argue there are things I might think of as akin to the sacred in the most monstrous of spots. Yeah. I So to be specific, actually, the um, for the audience, the image that I really, really like is it is one not just one body but like one head and the head has um four eyes so what happens mm -hmm. is the two eyes on the far left are one face the two eyes on the far right are another face but then there's a face in the middle that shares the two eyes that are toward the yes. center and so it's this kind of odd face that's actually three faces it, it's really really bizarre i think when when, when what we think of when we think of sort of Christian imagery, we're always thinking like Thomas Kincaid or something like that. It's very different. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, medieval imagery is way stranger, um, and to me, much more interesting. So yes, that kind of imagery—the sort of four-eyed, single-headed, three-faced image of God. Yeah, that's it, it is. I don't know if I'm going to say common, but it is definitely apparent. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in some of them, um, like the one that um, was in that show that uh, Sherry Linquist and I did, um, you can actually distinguish the three faces. There's a sort of older bearded one who is, would be God the Father, a younger bearded one who would be Christ, and then there's a sort of youthful beardless one who would be the Holy Spirit. And so by using these like subtle iconographic markers, we're able to distinguish between the three persons of the Trinity who are three and one, but they, while being all one, nonetheless are distinct entities at the same time. And this is, you know, the, the central mystery at the heart of Christianity. How could that be, right? What does it mean to be three and one and one and three? Um, and it's sort of a uh, fundamentally illogical property is not an impediment in any way. Uh, thinking back to what I was saying before about Augustine and the function of you know monsters in the world all of these things are possible because there are no rules that um constrain god uh, uh, according to uh theology you know christian theology um so figures that might seem impossible are merely instructive and i, I think that's a really good sort of circle right that the monsters exist because god says that they can exist um and this is an yeah. ex expression of, of his omnipotence okay so we're just going to conclude here then um all right anything less to concluding ideas i i guess i would just always encourage folks to um to really take monsters seriously and it doesn't mean to turn them into dour boring no fun things but they really do reward serious extended thought um and 
we tend to kind of jump immediately into sort of standard tropes about monstrosity um, and how we might represent monstrous figures. And the underpinnings for all that always merit careful thought to make sure that we're not passing on long uh, standing uh, problems, biases, prejudices that are kind of baked into the long standing history of monstrosity. Um, and so I would always encourage people to think a whole lot about monsters, but to try and break out of the uh, sort of standard paradigms that um, were conventionally, that we receive conventionally um, from media all over the place, everywhere from, you know, biblical illustration to Dungeons and Dragons to Hollywood. Um, that all of these bear long, long legacies that tend to be fascinating, but often have content embedded in them that we really don't want to keep passing on passively without thinking it through. Yeah, I this whole long journey for me to get, get to this sort of podcast project is is goblins. Okay, so my my D&D project with my uh, archaeological players is called uh, Welcome to Goblin Town. And that's exactly the sort of underlying theme for Goblin Town is I'm taking the trope of the goblin and then I'm sort of squashing and stretching it and like we've talked in this discussion, right? Goblin is sort of taken to be a monster, but now in the game, I kind of shifted over. Is it human? Is it monster? What is it? Um, right. And so I, I encourage everybody, you know, yeah, it's monsters are a plaything, and you can, well, even more than just a plaything, they really are an interesting tool to explore what it is to be human. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. The, the main thing that monsters are, are the thing that are not us. Um, and how we define the boundaries of us who we are is um, always in need of careful thought. Uh, how tightly do we want to draw the circle? How narrow do we want to make it? Uh, actual human beings have often been on the outside of that circle um, throughout history. Uh, and so I do think that monsters are actually a, a great opportunity to think through empathy and compassion. Um, for beings unlike us, which I would argue we ought be able to accomplish. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mittman. <laughs> and thus ends our conversation with Dr. Mittman about monsters. Once again, we come to the part of the show where we plot to kill the players. All this talk of saints makes me want to be kind and benevolent to my players. No. No, it doesn't. I want to terrify them like St. Bartholomew, waving his skin around like a towel in a locker room. <laughs> and I think that might be the interesting twist that we can do for this plotting to kill the players. Creating ways for the players to survive. In one game that I DM'd for some friends, the players ended up in front of a devil that they certainly couldn't beat. The level difference was a little bit too big. Really too big. I expected them to run away, but one character was obsessed with defeating evil and plunged into battle anyway. That character was quickly dispatched. I didn't want their story to end right then and there, so I quickly came up with a scheme for this character to come back as an undead. And I think that, that might be an interesting way to both keep the adventure going and express how the world of the campaign works. Does Paradise await the heroes once they've shuffled off their mortal coil? Or do they come back, bringing a small piece of the abyss with them each time? Like Rasputin in the movie Hellboy. And that could possibly be an even greater incentive to not die. Or the players might just want to die over and over again. Some people are weird. Tick monsters, sarcophagi, players' tears and wailing makes us smile. <laughs>